So yes, it is my pleasure to welcome you to all today today's program. Faculty Perspectives, you've already done this, creating and publishing OER courseware. My name is Brianna Chapman. I'm the Instruction and Scholarly Communication Librarian at Marymount University, and I'm a member of the Washington Research Library Consortium Textbook Affordability Working Group and the co-sponsor of today's program. Hi, I am Rachel Borchard. I'm the Scholarly Communications Librarian, and for the next few weeks, I'm still the Science Librarian at American University. I am also a member of the WLSC Working Group, and we'll also be co-hosting this program. Thank you so much, Rachel, for introducing yourself. And yay, Rachel is here. <laughs> but today's program is sponsored by the WRLC. Um, it is collaboration of nine universities in the DMV area. The WRLC Textbook Affordability Working Group supports faculty like you. So thank you so much for being here. Um, who want to replace expensive commercial textbooks with open textbooks and other affordable options for students because we know how important that is. Our team members represent most of the WROC schools, so please make a note of the contact at your school um, so you can follow up with them. We are a large group, so not every member's name is listed here, um, but about eight, school, eight of the school liaisons are listed here, and again, we do have nine, so if you're wondering, hey, where's my representative? please do not fret. You can reach out um, to open at wrlc.org and they will help you with that process. So uh, just a quick summary of what we'll be covering today. Um, so first we're gonna take a look at what open textbooks are and what their benefits are. Then Brianna will fill you in on the details of the review program and stipend and introduce the open textbook library. After that, I will be discussing uh, using Creative Commons licenses to make materials openly available and some common platforms for creating OER. And then Brianna and I are going to demo two popular platforms, Pressbooks and LibreText. And lastly, we will have uh, our faculty panel followed by question and answer period and discussion. Um, we are delighted to welcome biology professor Meg Bentley, former director of biology labs at American University, who will share her experiences with creating and implementing OER. And I will introduce Meg more fully later in the program. Now back to Brianna. Alrighty, so we will get started. Um, so we will, we're going to just do a quick introduction of open textbooks. I know some of you may be familiar or have some vague understanding, but, you know, we just wanted to touch on it a second and just, you know, explain why we stand so strongly behind them. The biggest reason we advocate for open textbooks is because they help create an equitable learning environment. Studies show that one of the biggest hurdles across all demographics of students is affording the cost of textbooks and textbook materials. So STEM majors have found to be the most impacted by the rising cost of textbooks. Non-traditional and first-generation students have found to be the most impacted also by the rising cost of textbooks and STEM majors, often resulting in students having to leave STEM programs and switch into programs with low textbook and textbook material costs. Um, but I did wanna switch over slightly for those that may be interested in the differences between open textbooks and commercial textbooks. They do have similarities, but major differences that do differ from commercial textbooks. So some of the similarities, as you may know, are they written by faculty and other experts in the subject area. In contrast, contrary to popular belief, open textbooks do undergo a rigorous editorial process, including a peer review. And one thing I also like to, which, which you will see in a lot of the open textbooks repositories, is that you can write your own personal review. So if you are someone in that subject area, especially if it's niche or very new, you can write a review over that textbook and say, hey, this is what I think of this textbook, and this is honestly how you can improve or add this information in, which I think is really great because with commercial textbooks, you can't really do that once they're published. Um, but also, too, the, some of the major differences are that students have online access, and it's completely free for students and faculty. This allows faculty and students to not have to worry about paywalls and limited access. Later on in this presentation, Rachel will touch on Creative Commons licenses, because I know some of you may have like okay, if we can do this, what, you know, what about Creative Commons licenses, which come up a lot. Rachel will touch on that for you guys. Um, but open textbooks have flexible Creative Commons licenses, giving gr users greater flexibility on how they're used. 
In addition, open textbooks are not restricted to standard copyright rules, so authors encourage their materials to be downloaded re and remixed, which is extremely beneficial when you need to tailor certain textbooks for your class needs. The reason I highlight these important characteristics of open textbooks is because together they lay a foundation for student success, which is our ultimate goal. And also too, especially for our professors in here that are in STEM, we understand like how fast it can move. And so a textbook that you were using one semester may not be relevant for your next semester. It's just rising costs. So consider open textbooks and them being able to be edited um, is something to take into consideration. Also too, I know some of you may be wondering what is our open textbook review stipend program. Um, but because you're attending today's workshop, you are all eligible to uh, write a review and receive a 200 stipend funded by the WRLC. You will receive an email from the Open Education Network, so OEN, after today's session, which will contain instructions and all the information you will need. Research by the Open Textbook Library has shown a direct correlation between faculty who review an open textbook and faculty who adopt one. So again, kind of like what I mentioned earlier, uh, you know, being able to review these textbooks, again, um, it's just something very important. It's not like commercial publishing where it goes out and you read it and you go, okay, class, don't actually read that chapter because this information is wrong. Um, you have your own input that you can put into this and also be paid for it. Um, so I am going to turn it back over to Rachel, who will touch on Creative Commons licenses. Thank you. Um, so as the title of our presentation mentions, you probably have materials that you've already created that can often be made into open education resources or OER fairly easily. Uh, the two main steps in order to make teaching materials open, um, open are to make it publicly accessible and to assign a license so that others understand the conditions under which they can use your material. Um, so as far as making things uh, publicly acceptable, I encourage you all to talk with your WRLC working group representative about how you can make that material publicly accessible through your library. Um, but Creative Commons is the licensing part um, that makes it a breeze to uh, make sure that other people understand how uh, your work is being used. Um, so you can see on the right hand side, um, this is just a chart of the different Creative Commons license options from the most free. Um, you see the little zero there is public domain where there are zero restrictions um, down to some of the more restrictive options. Um, for example, um, whether uh, it can be used for commercial purposes or not, you can see the dollar sign that's crossed out means non-commercial use only. Um, and as you go down, it um, protects your rights, but makes things less adaptable and freely available. It's called the, the free license culture. Um, so when you set up a license, uh, Creative Commons will actually tell you if your license is considered to be within the free license culture or not. Um, just to give you so, some thoughts about how to balance, how to protect your um, work versus making it reusable, shareable, and under what conditions, um, remixable, those are possible. Next slide, please. Um, so now we are going to turn to um, some different platforms and resources that you can use if you are someone who wants to create OER and not um, make available something that has already been created. Um, there are many different platforms that can be used for OER creation. And many of them are platforms that you're probably already using to create materials such as lectures or slides for your classes that can be then openly shared. Um, when it comes to written materials, something as simple as Microsoft Word can be used to create a PDF version of your material that can then be uploaded and shared. Um, for those familiar with GitHub, it's an open source platform for software and coding. And it can also be used to create materials, including um, syllabi. And I know at least one example of someone who has a GitHub syllabus at my university, um, but it can also be used to create longer works like books. Um, in fact, one such OER book, uh, which is listed in the slides, um, talks about using various open source materials to create your own OER in GitHub and also provides all of the underlying code that was used to create the book. So it's a pretty meta concept, um, an open book about open books. Um, however, for those who are less familiar with GitHub but wanting to use features beyond what a PDF can handle, such as a resource that requires frequent updating or incorporates multimedia or just has a fancier layout, 
there are other tools that exist. Um, Brianna and I are going to quickly introduce you to two of the main platforms that are used for many OER text publications, Pressbooks and LibreText. Um, and as you can see, uh, Pressbooks was used to create another kind of meta guide to open textbook publishing. Um, so I'm going to quickly demonstrate the back end of Pressbooks using a textbook that was uh, that is being built by one of uh, our AU faculty members. Um, however, before I start, it should be noted that Pressbooks use requires either a personal or institutional subscription, um, but in return, it gives you a lot of options to make to create very professional level texts. Let me share my screen. Oh, Brandon, do you mind? Thank you. <laughs> All right, there's, you do. there's our slides. Um, so this is the back end. Um, this is called the dashboard or just the overview. Um, you can see you can have multiple books here. I only have one book, uh, but you can have a whole catalog if you are interested in making more than one thing. Um, and you can see it's laid out into chapters. And I'm going to just go into one of those chapters so you can get an idea of what the editing looks like. Um, so this is some of the beginning, and you can see um, that it's very easy to add things like hyperlinks, add media. In fact, there's a little add media button right here. So if I wanted to add a new image, first I would upload the image, and then it's going to give me some options. Do I want to center it? Do I want, how big do I want that image to be, et cetera, and it's uh, going to format for me automatically. Um, also, if you are someone who likes to get down and dirty with the coding, you can also go directly to the HTML. Um, and I've done this from time to time when I just can't get the layout to look exactly how I want it to. <laughs> um, so that is also an option. Um, and then you can view your chapter to see what it looks like on the front end. So this is an example of what a chapter looks like. So you can see pretty close to what it looks like on the back end as well. All right, um, so you can create as many chapters as you want if this looks too long. Right, you can create lots of littler chapters or sub sections thereof to space it out over multiple pages. Um, but uh, I've been using it for a little while to help the faculty member um, get her book finished. And um, you know, you can see all of these different options. Um, I would say the the pickier you are about how you want it to be formatted and look uh, visually appealing. I would say the more time you're going to need to spend just learning the ins and outs of this, you know, these little options here. Um, but it makes it fairly simple to get something that looks reasonably professional looking. So I'm going to turn it over to Brianna. Yes, and just give me one second to uh, get my screen back, Sharon. Let's see here. Uh oh, that is the wrong share button. All righty, can everyone see my screen again? All righty. Yes, um, so similar to Pressbooks, LibreText offers a plethora of advanced features. Um, they are two different platforms. I know sometimes people get them confused, uh, but they are two different platforms. Um, but LibreText offers a plethora of advanced features that make creating an open textbook honestly less stressful. So LibreText was created in 2008 by a chemistry professor, which I personally believe gives LibreText an advantage over other open textbook platforms, having something created by an actual professor who firsthand works with textbooks and understands the impact it has on students, especially STEM students, has allowed LibreText to have some really cool features and be affordable. I truly believe it has helped make LibreText one of the most popular open textbook platforms to date. Um, but here's just a quick rundown of some of the cool features that you can include when creating an open textbook with LibreText. You can embed Multi multimedia videos within your textbook that can be created from scratch or existing videos you already have. These videos can help visualize complex topics. In addition, you can create 3D images and use Calcplot 3D, which is really cool. Um, and those in the computer world are not left out. One of the advanced features also works with program languages. So Jupyter, so Jupyter Code can be embedded right into the pages for students to try. 
Um, as somebody that has done some coding myself, like trying to learn how to code with a textbook is honestly, you're reading line by line and you don't know where you messed up. It can get very complex. So me knowing that, I was like, yay, reading that, um, you know, just learning more about LibreText. But also too, it works with Python and R and Octave. Um, Jupyter and LibreText can turn a few lines of code into a dynamic illustration of concepts and action. Also to a Libre text, it also explores the possibility of hosting dedicated computer, computer rational resources to cover the needs of more data intensive courses. So the so I know a lot of times when you get to stats and coding, it gets very complex. Um, and a lot of times it's like, I am actually very confused. And again, it's just a book that will say, I need you to do X, Y, and Z. Um, with LibreText, they are making it so students can actually see in real time what they are supposed to be doing, um, which I think is really cool. Also too, um, sorry, there was some music that popped out of nowhere. We will have to find that. Um, one of the biggest features that makes using LibreText lucrative is that existing open textbooks can be imported into LibreText. So you will not have to start from scratch. Um, Pressbooks, for example, would be an open textbook source that could be imported into LibreText. And again, that's why some people get a little bit confused and think they're the same thing, but they're not. Um, it gives instructors the ability to use multiple platform, platforms that fit their needs, but not having to create a book from scratch. Also, if students would like to print a copy or you yourself would want to print a copy, printing a 500 page textbook printed and bound in soft cover is about $12. In a hardbound printed book in color would be about 35, which is still vastly cheaper than your traditional textbook. I know here in the state of Virginia, there was a survey that was done and over 5,000 students responded. And about 78% of those students had like worries about continuing their education because of textbook costs. So understanding that some of these resources just exist um, to me is amazing because faculty members are able to one get new information out to their students quickly and also to have an option and not be bound by a commercial publishing that says you have to use this they now have options for their students and i am going to demo a little bit not as good as rachel but just to show you the basics of like how you yourself can go and explore um, before committing if you wanted to make a commitment so give me one second i have to reshare my screen so it can show Brianna, if you don't mind a question in the middle, um, there's a question in the chat about how they get an account and start creating a Libra text textbook. Yeah, so if you go to, sorry, I was, I thought my screen was sharing, but it is not. Um, give me one second here. I act like an old lady when it comes to sharing my screen. I, like I did not grow up with the generation of computers. Uh, Zoom always gets me, but here on Libra text website, and the Zoom bar is in the way per usual. If you go over here to contact and put your contact information in, they will get back to you um, about setting up an account and also just additional information that you may need. But if you wanna explore a little bit, um, so here we'll go to explore the libraries, which is biology. So if you want to see some of the things that other campuses are doing or just explore the bookshelves, um, you can come here and we'll just like look at uh, introduction to general biology. So as you see some of those supplemental models, a lot of times students will have to pay extra for that, right, with a, a commercial uh, textbook. But here we have, see, let's click on here and see what we have. So again, this is kind of some supplementary material that students may be able to use. And again, with commercial publishing, they would have had to pay for this. This is completely free. And again, this is just an example that I'm showing you. And sorry if I'm scrolling fast. I wanna make sure we have enough time for our speaker. And again, just kind of, you know, giving you a preview of what LibreText looks like in action and kind of what it would look like on the student end. And for our sign-in. So yes, if you wanted, I know somebody asked about an account. Um, I know for me, like I've sent a request in just because I want to start an account with them because I'm working on some textbooks myself, um, but just sending in a request because I need additional information um, just to give back to my institution. 
But if you'll see that sign in um, request an instructor account, you will have to send a request for that. And Brianna, if I can interrupt with another question, sorry. Um, my understanding is that unlike Pressbooks, this would be free to use, but um, that once you submit something for publishing, that it has to go through their fairly lengthy queue. So this can be a bit of a lengthy process. Is, is that correct? From my understanding, yes. Um, from what I've heard back, like they're trying to come up with a quicker process. Uh, the person that created it, um, I'm blanking on his last name, um, but he is still at UC Davis as a faculty member and full-time instructor. So he's like, I didn't expect this to get so popular. Um, so they are making some changes to how they are running their business because it is so popular. Thank you. All righty, and I am going to reshare my screen. Well, actually, I'm going to stop my screen really quick and then reshare it back to our presentation. And I'm so sorry for all the screen changes. That is something that just happens when you're trying to demo and make sure everybody gets all the correct information. All righty. And Rachel, I'll hand it back to you. Thank you. Um, so today we would like to welcome Dr. Meg Bentley, an American University faculty member who will be discussing her experience with creating and incorporating an open lab notebook into biology lab courses. Uh, Dr. Meg Bentley is the Director of STEM Partnerships and Innovation at American University, and Dr. Bentley previously served as the Director for Biology Teaching Labs. She also helps lead the Initiative for Science Education, Equity, and Ethics, and also serves as the co-PI for the NSF Advance Grant, assessing gender and racial equity among STEM faculty. Meg, thank you for joining us today. It's all yours. Of course. Do you want, how much time do I have? Do you want me to talk or give a quick PowerPoint or I'm prepared for either? <laughs> it's really up to you. Um, we, you know, we have a good half an hour left. We wanna okay. make sure to leave some time for some questions. Okay. Um, but how you would like to structure this is entirely up to you. Okay. Let me give a quick PowerPoint because I have a couple of syllabi to show that I think would. <laughs> oh, can I share my screen, please? Yeah, I think you are listed as co-host. Oh. You should oh, be. Oh, I have. It's asking me to take over. This will stop. Do you want to continue? Okay. Sorry about that. Okay. Um. I have to organize once I'm here. So, um, so I'm, I, I'll try and hit the highlights of this this presentation that I've given um, a couple times before. But um, so, like Rachel mentioned, uh, for the past ten years, I've been involved in laboratory education in biology at American University. Um, and I think one of the biggest changes we've made <laughs> uh, is transitioning from what we used to be in our non-majors class to what we currently are. Um, and I think the adaptation of OER resources didn't just spark those specific changes, but like actually pushed us to think differently pedagogically. And so if you're thinking about adopting this, I think you should get ready for like a lot of your assumptions and practices and teaching to be pushed on when you do, but that's fine because it will have impact beyond the textbook, beyond the classes and the text and the choices that you make in that one particular class. So anyway, so what we did was we had this course called Bio 100 Essential Biology. Um, it's a general education course for non-majors. Uh, it's part of our AU core. It's, it has a lecture and lab course. And it's a big class, like we, it, you know, it's the baby bio class that our, our students at AU take if, if they, for their, for their science requirement. So we have a lot of students, a lot of sections, uh, and there's a lot of people time dedicated to maintaining and, and producing and teaching in the course. Um, it used to be called great experiments, but now it's called essential biology. Um, and I say that because this was the syllabus I used. <laughs> in summer of 2012 when it was called Great Experiments. And this was before our transition. Um, we had, so again, the, there was a lecture portion and a lab portion. For the lecture portion, we required this biology science for life textbook that costs about $120. This is non-majors, okay? So we required that. And then we also had a lab manual that we actually wrote ourselves. 
So we had all this content. We we had control over the content, but we didn't. But students needed to order it through a third party vendor, and then it would arrive in the bookstore a week or so after they ordered it. And it also cost like thirty five dollars. So for this non majors course, this thing that was a requirement in a discipline outside of their major, they had to spend upfront about $160. And, and at this time, we also had a lab fee. So there was a lot going on in this course. So, um, and, 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 and you'll see, there are a lot of things that this actually um, helped us with beyond just adopting OER. So um, like you all today, the reason we started doing this is because someone in our CTRL reached out and promised us money um, and resources and help and support to do this. So this is just, uh, we actually applied for an open educational resources grant for the course. It was a collaborative effort. Um, Zoom, like, like Brianna, Zoom is hiding things. Uh, so these are the, with myself, these are the other faculty who worked on, on the course. Chris Tudge uh, was a lecturer in the course um, and still is. Uh, Sarah Knight Marvar uh, was the assistant lab director at the time and helped and was really instrumental in uh, adopting the lab notebook part of it. And then Tova Salcido was actually a lecturer and um, taught the lab as a TA. So this was the team uh, alongside me that, uh, that actually did this work. So at the time, our, these were our goals. And I look back on these and think, huh, what a deficit mindset we had for <laughs> changing from a traditional textbook to open act to open educational resources. So we were really worried about compromising the academic standard. Um, you know, the textbook being this pinnacle of knowledge, uh, we were worried about making sure we picked resources that were important. We were really focused on just doing this for non-majors because we thought, again, in that same context, um, but we really thought this would be helpful for other not for other general education non-majors courses where it, asking students for, you know, those textbook costs beyond, <laughs> beyond, uh, you know, the lab fees and the tuition they already pay is pretty uh, substantial. So, um, and I just mentioned these things because uh, these were not actually the things we had trouble with. We didn't have trouble finding good stuff. So what did we do? What we did was in, la in lecture, we actually adopted this OpenStax uh, Concepts in Biology textbook. Um, it is one of those textbooks that you can print out if you want a hard copy. I actually have a copy somewhere in my office because I'm a reader and writer. Um, but it's also available free um, online. And it's available in multiple languages, which I also think is a kind of a cool deal. Um, this is the non-majors textbook. And OpenStax has like a suite of tons of content topics. Um, and they have some textbooks that are for non-majors and majors in, a, in some STEM fields. So um, I would definitely, if you haven't checked that out and gone to their library, do it. Um, so that was for lecture. And then for lab, what we did was we created, um, we took our lab notebook or our lab manual and then put that information into Pressbooks, right? And so that meant that we could um, have more control over distribution of our lab content. Um, and uh, and updating was became became more sort of streamlined into our semester by semester uh, teaching schedule. So this is just what it again we did this in press books. Uh, Rachel gave a really nice demonstration of what that looks like on the back end. I definitely um, it is really pretty on the front end too. We used to just do this in Word and print it out and had students print it out, and that was okay, but. There's a certain professionalism that I think is associated with press books that really convinces students that this is something that is worth reading. <laughs> okay, so here are our challenges from this first iteration. Uh, so we got our grant and then we decided to do a lot of the work over the summer. Um, um, yeah, so learning press books was straightforward, um, but required you required time. Do not think you're just going to copy and paste um, and figuring out what your rules are for formatting and font size and all that stuff. Write that stuff down at the very beginning and stick to it. Just ask someone what good practices are and try not to have to make that decision, I think. Um, so it did take because of that, it did take significant time to transfer our content. I think as we were transferring, we were also sort of trying to evaluate whether 
we were trying to rewrite a little bit and refine uh, correct typos and things like that. Um, one of the challenges and one of the things that did not slow us down, but was a fun challenge to sort of think about was uh, there are a gazillion things you can add now. You have, you don't have a hard copy, right? You have like clicks, it, it can, students can click some videos. There's all this stuff that's really amazing. And so it does take time to vet what you want to share. Um, cause you have to make sure that's aligned pedagogically. It's, uh, doesn't, it's, you know, it's relevant or it's at the right level of detail. Uh, there's a, you know, it's, it's not insulting. <laughs> there's all sorts of, you'd be surprised how much OER stuff, like what, and if you're choosing, watch to the end. There's always fun stuff. You know, I've watched a couple of videos where they go totally off the rails at the end. So don't assume, um, don't assume anything. And then um, because just the transition to Pressbooks was um, just time consuming and took you know, time and brain power, we weren't able to actually update any curriculum and we try and update curriculum each week. So don't pick this on the time when you're really shift, trying to shift like content or, or anything like that. Um, but successes, and these are some we had, some we, we had predicted and some were, were delightfully wonderful to discover. Uh, one of the greatest ones were that students were ready to go on the first day of class. So it used to be that it took like a couple weeks, like students, it's a non-majors class. They shop around. They're like, they go to the first week, they go, eh. Then in the second week, they commit, and then they order their lab notebook. So they don't have their lab notebook or the textbook until like week four. And so here, with it being free and like accessible and and clickable, right, they could they didn't have to sort of make a decision based on, um, or, or they didn't have to not prepare for class when they were still sort of shopping around. Um, Pressbooks definitely made subsequent updates much easier to complete and track as a group. Before I did a lot of emailing and uploading the latest version of things, um, but now with, a, it's like a Google Doc, right? Everyone can access it. You can have, you can have, um, it, it just made, I could say to a TA or a colleague, hey, why don't you, you, that's a great idea, make that update, you do it. And I knew I could go and check and we could work together in a document. So that was really uh, delightful actually. Um, uh, we could link to OpenStax. That was the coolest thing. Like we could make connections in the course material for the students without having to say it. Uh, a thousand times. So we could actually justify like, hey, remember you learned this in lecture if you want to read about it and sort of demonstrate how things were connected. And that helps students learn, I think. Much easier to disseminate course materials to students and instructors and TAs. Um, you know, there's movement in TAs. Uh, the other cool thing was that students could access material after the class had ended, which I think is pretty cool for a non-majors course where you want them to continue to engage. And then finally, just help us let go of this requirement to go back to the textbook, right? We now could do anything we wanted um, as long as it met our criteria for quality um, and was relevant, right? So it really pushed us to think about other things. And that's where we are today. Um, so today, here's the syllabus <laughs> of this same course. This is a better syllabus. This is more inviting <laughs> than my, like, black text on white background, which focuses on the textbook. Um, so we still use OpenStax today in lecture. Um, we've added tons of things to it, uh, visualizations, case stories, news stories, because the expectation is set up there that like it's an open education resource course entirely. So you are not, the students aren't tied to their, their sources or their resources are not tied to the textbook. So it really expands how they think about what's, what's expertise. Right. We don't have any, we don't use Pressbooks anymore. We actually, because we, uh, AU moved from Blackboard to Canvas sometime during the pandemic. Um, and so that transition, we actually, Canvas, I think, does a really nice job of sort of presenting it beautifully, more beautifully and sort of more aesthetically um, than Blackboard did. So we ended up sort of taking all those lessons learned and just dumping them into Canvas. Um, and then we have all, all the, the positive things I talked about are still there within Canvas. 
um, except maybe that it's not accessible to anyone outside of who belongs to the Canvas site, right? That is that is a big distinction. Um, uh, we started to really align our weekly assessments um, with these open access uh, or open uh, educational resources. And we also changed the final, the projects. We changed the assessments. We used to have really traditional lab reports for non-majors that might not be a great use of their, like a great skill to develop. When are they ever gonna write a lab report or scientific report again? Now we've shifted that to be, um, more, uh, we, they write a popular press article or create an infographic for a unique audience. So again, I think expanding our suite of resources as teachers sort of shifted how we thought about the course in terms of assessments and resources and things like that. And then certainly this, this really helped us make and think about how the class is equitable. Um, I mean, this syllabus is a lot more exciting than my syllabus, right? Um, you don't come in on day one and you're met with $160 worth of fees. And I keep having to harass you because you haven't bought the textbook yet for a course that you're not really potentially into. So it's just made it more inviting and therefore more inclusive. Uh, and that goes for the assessments and everything between day one and the final day of the course. I think the, the inclusion of open edu education resources, the textbook, and uh, the other things that it allowed us to do um, actually allow us to demonstrate how science is, is a part of students' lives. They come in thinking this is a discipline that's not part of what, who I am or who I'm going to be or what I need to learn to be a good citizen. And we try and push at that a little bit and try and use those resources to help them see those connections. Um, and we use resources that they're gonna interact with after they leave this artificial course that we've created for them. So uh, the other great thing about, um, about sort of getting away from traditional textbooks that don't, uh, that really focus on content rather than maybe other issues that you wanna discuss is that you can either create or use these resources so that you can have conversations about diversity, equity, and inclusion, anti-racism, accessibility, um, sometimes those aren't handled in the way that you would like to handle them for your student audience. This is your chance to really customize what that experience looks like for your students. And you can customize it each semester, right? If you have, you know, time and it's important. And then I think it's also important to say um, the resources and away from the textbooks actually decenters you as the expert. I think this is important to note because this is sometimes something that faculty can have, have struggle with a little bit. Uh, I think this total adoption of sort of different content helps you see you are no longer like the holder of all the information. The textbook is no longer the holder of all the information. Um, and I think that's a good thing to remind our students when we're trying to invite them into the discipline or get them to think about how they can engage in the work. So I, I say that because I think that's a reaction that some folks have. Finally, my recommendations, and then I'll be quiet. Um, don't do this alone. <laughs> it's too hard. <laughs> it's really hard, and it's a lot of work. So do it as a team. Uh, find your librarians. Um, get some money to do it. As those are all good things. And don't think it's going to take a couple weeks. I mean, if you're writing a textbook, obviously don't think about that. But if you're trying to like pick one course, give yourself time to do that. And you can do little bits at a time. So um, go slow to go fast doing little bits. Um, use the resources to like expand the course content. You don't need to necessarily replace everything. Uh, tell your students you're doing this. I think students are into this. They love it. They want, it, it demonstrates that you are thinking about their needs and their experience. So if you're gonna spend time doing this, get credit for it <laughs> from your student's perspective. Um, anticipate changing how you prepare for class. I think a lot of times, you know, we're all experts in the textbook, but if you assigned a popular press article or um, are using someone else's textbook and it's their different case studies, you might have to prepare a little more for uh, an activity in class. So don't be prepared for that, schedule time in for that. Uh, link assessments to the, to the resources, don't 
it's not, this is part of the learning experience. This is not, um, it's not the cherry on top. It is the Sunday. Uh, invite your students to help. That was awesome. When we discovered we could actually give extra credit by having our students like edit the, the chapter to make it better and to be co-authors, that was like a game changer. Cause I was like, I don't have to figure out what they don't know. They can tell me what they don't know. So there are, there are ways you can do that. Um, and then remember to apply what you've learned in one class to all the others. Uh, we did this in our one class, in our one lab class. And I, at the time I coordinated like four other courses with lab components. And I kind of forgot to take those lessons over. So keep that in the back of your head as well. Um, and then have fun. This is like a fun collaborative thing that you can do with colleagues or students, graduate students or undergrads. So just invite other folks in. I think that's sort of part of the, the culture in OER. So enjoy it as you're doing it. And good luck. And I'll stop there. Thank you so much, Meg. Wow, that was a lot of really good advice and information packed into a short presentation. I love it. Um, so we now have a, a bunch of time for people to ask questions. If you want to unmute yourself um, or type a question in the chat, and we're we're happy to uh, monitor those, monitor those, and make sure that Meg is responding to them as well. Um, but to start with, I can uh, ask a question, Meg. I know that one of your grants is is looking at retention of STEM majors from under underrepresented minorities. And I'm wondering how you see OER playing a role in in that kind of larger project. That's such an interesting. See, this is how this goes into all the other things you do. I don't. I don't think I've ever asked my students the real impact of this. Like we've seen it because we've had unsolicited sort of feedback, but I think that's actually another great recommendation. Incorporate this into your evaluation of the course. Um, and and if you're and if you have colleagues or departments are resistant at all, which I hope they're not, um, you might also ask students, just do like a survey of your department, of your students in your department and ask them like, would this be meaningful? Um, because it's not, it's not just about the students who have financial challenges or it's, a, it's about, it's about like access to information. So don't think of this as like a deficit mindset for like helping the poor students out. Think of this as like changing how we decide what's important to share in a class. Um, and I didn't really answer your question because I don't think I have a good answer, but I'm, now I'm going to write that idea down because I think that this is something to actually can, to ask students about. And I don't know if, does anyone, does the, does your organization have like surveys that you've asked students to do? I guess, Brianna, you mentioned that survey done in Virginia, but. I was going to say, I can put a link to the text to the Viva results. Um, one of the more fascinating things that I, I got away from that large study, which was about 4,500 students, um, was they measured categories of vulnerability. Um, and they found, and there was, I think, seven different categories, maybe more. And they found that the more categories of vulnerability a student fell into, the more important this was to them and the more uh, the impact of buying uh, classroom texts. Uh, matter to them. Um, Meg, I'm also hoping you could talk a little bit about some of those unsolicited feedback uh, that you got from students. So um, I think links to, I mean, certainly videos and sort of expanding the types of things uh, that are available to students, I think is really impactful because reading science can be really hard for a non-scientist. <laughs> you know, we we write this down and I'm the I'm an I have a PhD in molecular biology. I, you know, and I'm writing about a broad set of topics that that I don't necessarily have like expertise in, right? And I'm trying to make it refine it. Um, so being open, so we had a lot of students say, um, the, the the additional materials were really helpful in me helping myself learn and figuring out the right and so so and and that's part of the reason we also sort of got away we went to Canvas we have really pared down just the reading that students have to do 
because we found that they just weren't doing it necessarily. So that's one thing we found out. And then I, I think we actually had a lot of non-majors really excited to help write the, the, the text. They really actually are much better at that than we ever could be. And so when we offered that for extra credit one semester, that was a really unexpectedly good thing. So I think, and it was nice to know those students were really engaged, like and really, because you think sometimes you lose your non-majors, but you, and you do lose some of them, but um, so it was sort of those, so what other unsolicited advice we got? And just, I mean, access on the very first day, I don't, I don't think we quite appreciated how we had set up a system where we dug our students a hole. We said, here, get in this hole first and now climb out. <laughs> so uh, I think we thought it, you know, we thought it was sort of straightforward material to catch up on. And so um, I think we actually retained more students because they were ready to go on day one. They weren't, because by the time they're in week three and they don't have their lab notebook, they're like, okay, Loud and clear. <laughs> I'll go over there. So, um, so I think I think that's sort of the things that we heard about, and not having to pay for the textbook for a class that they are going to. This is their last biology. I mean, just that very obvious piece of information. They really appreciated that we understood they were not biology majors. And we accepted that. We didn't try. I felt like they thought we were trying to change them when we were making them buy a textbook. And they definitely mentioned, I think the, the ones who like took the course and then learned that we had stopped charging them. They're like, oh, it's like, I hate this textbook. You want this textbook for, yeah. So um, it kind of made them mad on the very first day. And so we, that, that went away. And we started at a different place of like openness and and all the fun things that you can do and about biology and how it interacts with your life. So they, their mindset was different on that first day. And it took me a long time to get to that. Their mindset was different on the first day. I feel like the common th thread throughout a lot of what you've said is just meeting the students where they are instead of this is where I am and how I see things of kind of starting with the students and building back from there. Um, Angelique. Yeah, um, I'm... Uh, I'm about two years into my own OER education, maybe three, but you touched on three points that have been very exciting to hear you talk about, not theory, but practical application. One, the value of perpetual access, you know, um, and if you have anything you'd like to comment about that. Two, that the open pedagogy has, re has informed how you assess the learning and that the students, especially non-STEM students, when they're creating these infographics, they're, they're, I've read more than one paper, they are uniquely prepared to communicate with each other and create this kind of ancillary material in a peer-to-peer -peer sense that instructors really have a more difficult, challenging time replicating. And that, you know, and it allows them to see themselves as contributors to the knowledge pool. And that these same assignments are also not throwaway assignments where they're not revisited and that actually they're living, uh, they're living entities that can continue to be built upon. And I know that we are running short of time, but you know, you this is like one of the more fleshed out conversations we've had from actual creator of a whole text. So I'd love to hear uh, what you might have to say. Thank you for articulating what I just said in such perfect <laughs> language. <laughs> um, you know, we have seen that with the with the final projects, the infographics, and the and the popular press articles, and we've tried to sort of push that even more because these, I mean, these students come up with the most amazing ideas, right? And so as a teacher, that is so satisfying to see. And before we had a structure that didn't allow that, right? So it meant teaching was not as much fun. So that's the other thing that this has changed. But um, I think we're trying to even expand that. And maybe Rachel, I should talk to you about this because we have this suite of, of all this information, infographics, and these articles, which have, which are, you know, which are reference materials. And we've thought about, do we now go back and put those into the course itself? Or how do we allow them to take these materials or these products that they've created and get more out of them than beyond a class assignment? Um, 
So I don't know if I address what you want to hear, but um, we're trying to like stretch it a little more. And it's just, you know, it's challenging to sort of, um, I've moved into this new position, but I might go have a conversation with the new lab director and <laughs> um, talk to them about, hey, maybe we should just like close the loop. And now these students become the teachers for them, which would be really amazing. So. We have a few minutes left. I wanna make sure that people have time to ask any questions that they might have for, for Meg, for Brianna, for, for myself, any of us. We have a few other members of the WLC committee, including Angelique, who is our, our current chair. Um, so I would say anything related to OER, the presentation that has been on your mind now is a great time to bring it up. So as I'm doing the instructor pause. <laughs> I'm not seeing, oh, Mark, yes. I had a question about, I was trying to figure out how to formulate this, but about open materials that are sort of, how to handle open materials that are clearly branded with another university. So like at the intro level in computer science, they're open textbooks that are sort of neutral in a way. They're hosted by a consortium, multiple people wrote them. But a lot of the recent material that's open is clearly like, this is the intro to deep learning at MIT course. It's an intro to deep learning.org. It is open license, but it's very clearly like the MIT course. It's not some neutral textbook you can sort of aside. And what do you like, do people use those? Is it strange? How would students approach like be given basically material from a different university's course? Uh, I haven't really figured out how to do it. So I was wondering if anyone had thoughts on that. Well, I can jump in just really quickly with what, and I can share what I've seen. I'm not an instructor, I'm a librarian, but I can share what I've seen. Um, I think that would probably end up being more concerned for the, uh, the instructor than the student. The student is relieved to begin day one. And the student is relieved to have access, you know, like, you know, uh, access to the material as soon as possible and participate in, in complete assignments. And if it is open material, it should be available for revision depending on the CC license attached. So if there are some items that aren't, you know, hyper relevant to your course or your institution, depending on the license and the amount of labor and time you have, you know, that can uh, be uh, updated and modified to suit your needs. Um, so I guess it's a, your tolerance for, you know, anything that might be confusing um, and also the license and how available it is. And MIT, um, they do an excellent job with what they provide. And I think most of their license are fairly generous. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, thanks. But you know, if you don't have the time to change all the names, and the students are not concerned, you know, you can hit the ground running, uh, hit the ground running a lot sooner. Depending yeah, I guess on for stuff like videos, I could just say this is the video. Uh, you could look at this as supplemental material. Uh, exactly. I'll just post to the chat an example of sort of one of the courses I had in mind. So. And that highlights a big factor about OER is that, you know, it, it can be an, an entire textbook and program like you'll see at AAU, or you can just borrow one ancillary piece, one slide deck, one test, one quiz, one video. You know, it doesn't have to be an onboarding that takes a whole year. Oh, that makes sense. Thanks. Thanks for that question, Mark. I can see Meg is in agreement there. Um, we have a couple of minutes left. Any final questions, thoughts, resources we can send your way? <laughs> okay, well, I think I'm going to turn it back to Brianna to wrap up. Yes, um, thank you everyone for coming out today. As I mentioned before, you will be receiving an email from the OEN. Uh, open Education Network with a link to, you know, write a review and also receive a workshop survey. When the review has been completed, WRLC will email directions for receiving the stipend. And again, thank you guys so much for attending today. I know it is probably right after meetings, about to jump back into meetings or to teaching. It is raining here in the DMV, so please be safe if you are traveling to and forth from campus. And thank you again.